Tonight will be session four of our Zechariah Bible study, but as you have noticed by now, I'm on video instead of in person. It is uh, October the 7th, and we're going to be doing session four. Understanding the book of Zechariah is crucial to understanding the prophetic plan of God. But it's as, it is rarely studied and rarely discussed in the church today. Why? It's not easy. The New Testament authors directly quote or allude to Zechariah's content some 40 times, making it one of the most quoted of all Old Testament works. I'll be using several resources, as I've mentioned in the earlier weeks, and uh, refer to your outline for those resources. I want to give credit to the writers of those resources. Zechariah reveals more about the coming Messiah than all the other minor prophets combined. Zechariah's message is clear regarding the coming of the Messiah to the present earth, specifically on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And number two, it is also clear about the establishment of Jerusalem as the throne of King Jesus. Tonight we'll continue with our visions that God gave to Zechariah, specifically vision number five, the lampstand and the two olive trees. I'll begin reading with Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. Then the angel who had been talking with me returned and woke me, as though I had been asleep. What do you see now? he asked. I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl of oil, of oil on top of it. Around the bowl are seven lamps, each having seven spouts with wicks. And I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. Then I asked the angel, what are these, my Lord? What do they mean? Don't you know, the angel asked. No, my Lord, I replied. Zechariah's fifth vision points out that through the Holy Spirit, Israel will become a witness to the world. Now, I want you to get something as we start this tonight. Through the Holy Spirit, Israel will become a witness to the world. What's the church supposed to be in the church age? The same thing Israel was going to be in the Old Testament, the church was supposed to be in the New Testament. A witness to the world by the power of the Holy Spirit, the light of God inside of people, reflecting the glory of God to the planet, to the people of the world. This vision is a personal message to Zerubbabel, a ruler of the returning exiles from Babylon who led the rebuilding effort of the second temple in Jerusalem. Now, if you don't understand that, you're going to miss the sequence of events. By the time that Zechariah comes on the scene, the temple's destroyed uh, they're in exile, and now Zerubbabel will be one of the guys called by God to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. This message, vision number five, Zechariah chapter four, is uh, outlining that God's going to do something through Zerubbabel. This vision, however, goes far beyond that of Zerubbabel in the second temple. And it also focuses on the final restoration of Israel. So inside this scripture, you're going to see two things. One is more of a present day revelation of Zerubbabel rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, but a future announcement of the final days in which God will put his king on the throne in Jerusalem, Jesus. Notice that Zechariah doesn't understand this vision of the gold lampstands, the bowl, seven spouts, seven wicks, and two olive trees, one on each side. That's the vision. Let me say it again. There's a gold lampstand, there's a bowl, there's seven spouts, seven wicks, and two olive trees, one on each side. The seven-branch lampstand is a menorah that will stand in the temple that Zerubbabel will build, and that lampstand serves as what? A symbol of the nation of Israel, a lampstand. Why? Because Israel would be the one through which he would shine his light, the light of the glory of God to the world. Over the lampstand is a bowl, and on each side of the lampstand is an olive tree. Zechariah sees a pipe 
emptying olive oil into a bowl, and from the bowl are seven smaller pipes or bowls providing oil to each of the seven lamps. There are a total of 49 such smaller pipes, if you really look at the picture of the vision. The fact that the oil comes straight from its source, the tree, emphasizes an inexhaustible supply of oil. In fact, the one common element in the whole vision is that of, that of oil from an olive tree. The spout, the bowls, the 49 ducks, the seven lamps. Oil is commonly used in the Scripture to symbolize what? The Holy Spirit. What is oil doing in this scene? It's creating light. The Holy Spirit. Now let's go to verse 5. Don't you know, the angel asked. No. Don't you understand the vision? No, my Lord, I replied. Then he said, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my Spirit. What's he revealing to Zechariah through this vision? It will not be by force, it will not be by strength, it will not be by humans' ideas or plans, it will be by the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of the Lord, the, the Spirit of the Lord of heaven's armies. Verse 7, nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. What? what? To rebuild the temple. Now that's the, the scene that's unfolding in the time of that day, some, what, over 2,000 years ago. 20, almost 2,500 years ago. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in place, the people will shout, May God bless it. May God bless it. Not only is God announcing to Zechariah through this vision and the prophetic message through the angel, that Zerubbabel will rebuild the Jewish temple after 70 years of Babylonian exile. He also proclaims that the people will stand and shout a sentence. May the Lord bless it. May the Lord bless it. Do you think that didn't happen? Do you think there was any way that didn't or couldn't happen? Force and strength of man will not complete the prophecy of God. Force and strength of man, the will of man, will not complete this prophecy, but by the very Spirit of God. It will be completed. Nothing can stop the Spirit from accomplishing the Word of God which reveals the plan of God. Now hold that thought. You're seeing that unfold, that this light, this olive oil, the Holy Spirit, through a people called Israel, were supposed to reflect the glory of God to the world. And now the church age, just today, well, is anything going to stop the church? The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. The Holy Spirit's power will accomplish everything. That's not the question, is it? The question, will you be a part of it or will you be on the sidelines? Nothing can stop the Holy Spirit from accomplishing the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God reveals the plan of God. A temple would be rebuilt 70 years after Babylon tore it down. Zerubbabel didn't, did just that. He did just that, just as it was prophesied. Only God could have convinced the Persians to release the Jews and then fund the rebuilding of a Jerusalem temple. Why in the world would the king of Persia ever have such a crazy idea that let's let go all of these captives that we actually took when we took over Babylon. Let's let them go, finance their project, have them go back and rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. Only God could have put that in the mind of the king of Persia, but that's what happened. Verse 8. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's army has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings. What? This rebuilding of the temple, it'll look like a small beginning because it won't look like the first temple. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hands. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. The second Jerusalem temple, what Zerubbabel was about to rebuild, the people returning from Persia, from Babylon to 
rebuild the temple. Would it be as glorious as the one that Solomon built back in the time right after David? No, no, nothing like that temple. The second Jerusalem temple was nothing like the glory of Solomon's temple. But what did God say? Do not despise these small beginnings. This is where it will start. In fact, I read in the text of those rebuildings that some of the older people, I guess they would have been teenagers when they were captured and Nebuchadnezzar carried them off into bondage. Because now, 70 years after the exile, they're coming back to rebuild the temple. And the Bible says they weep when they see the glory of the second temple in comparison to their childhood memories of the first temple. Verse 11. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on each side of the lampstand? And what are the two olive branches that pour out golden oil through two gold tubes? Don't you know, he asked. No, my Lord, I replied. Uh, Zechariah said, no, I don't know. I'm not getting it. I don't understand. Then he said to me, they represent two heavenly beings who stand in the court of the Lord of all the earth. Two heavenly beings that stand in the court of the Lord of all the earth. God's plan was for Israel to reveal the glory of God to the world, but Israel refused to follow after God. They refused to be the vessel through which God would pour His Spirit, His light, His presence, and reflect His glory to the world. They refused through willful disobedience and sin and idolatry. God is light, and God is the source of all light. That light was to shine through Israel. That light was supposed to, designed to, light up the whole world. Ultimately, the details of the two olive trees were to be revealed to the Apostle John in what we now know as the book of Revelation. Notice the context of these two olive trees. It is in the final Jerusalem temple. I'm going to do something. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 11. So hold the thought of an event that happens 520 years B.C. And fast forward to a day, maybe really soon, when God reveals um, the final Jerusalem temple. Revelation 11. 1. Then I was given a measuring stick and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the number of worshipers. But do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now pause for a moment that there's something going on inside the temple that is strictly for the Jewish people. But there's something going on in the courtyard that is primarily Gentile. Who are they? I'll talk about that at a later time. But who are they they're Gentiles, they're non-Jews in the outer courtyard. It's called that they're trampling on the holy city for 42 months. But God's still doing something with his people during that time. Verse 3, and I will give power to two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap and will prophesy during those 1260 days. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. You see how Zechariah 520 B.C. is now connecting to Revelation of John, which would be in the first century church to us 2,000 years ago, but pointing forward to the last days. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. What's that tell you? These two who stand in the presence of God now will stand on the earth near the Jerusalem temple and they will carry out a plan of God that's unstoppable. Anyone who tries to stop them, they must die. They die in a certain way. Fire comes out from them and they die. Unstoppable. Verse 6. They have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and the oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Do you think that will make them popular to the unbelieving world in those days of the tribulation? Or do you think that will make them hated by the world? The world will hate them. Why, they have the power 
over the elements. Verse 7, when they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them. Who's the beast? He is the Antichrist that comes under the power of Satan. He will come and he will kill these two witnesses. And their body, verse 8, and their bodies will lie on the main street of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where their Lord was crucified. And for three and a half days, all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. They don't pick up their bodies. They just witness them. A worldwide television, satellite, whatever, however, internet. The world is going to celebrate the death of the two witnesses. The world will praise the Antichrist and the power of Satan for killing, finally ridding the planet of these two witnesses that have come against uh, the people, the inhabitants of the earth by stopping the rain, for example. No one will be allowed to bury them. Verse 10, all the people who belong to this world, that'll tell you a whole lot about who we're referring to. All the people that belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. The two prophets were sent by God. And the torment was to be one last effort to turn people to God. But instead of turning to God, they will hate God even more. And they'll hate His witnesses even more. It tells you a lot about how the church will stand up until the last days. The church is to shine the light of God to save people, to turn people toward God. But people of the world will actually instead hate the church. They will hate the church. They'll hate Christians. Verse 11. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them. And they stood up. These people that the world had celebrated and exchanged gifts because of their death. Where are they? They're in Jerusalem. They're near the temple. Now, they're alive again. And they stood up. Terror struck all those who were staring at them. When the world sees these three that had tormented, excuse me, the two witnesses that had tormented the earth by revealing the glory of God, the power of God over the earth, now they're terrorized. Their terror struck those all those who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called the two prophets, come up here. This is a rapture event. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. Can you imagine being on the earth and actually seeing this take place? You've seen their resurrection and now you've seen their ascension. When that happens, verse 13, at the same time there's a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. What city? Jerusalem. 7,000 people died in that earthquake and everyone else was terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. These two witnesses, these two olive trees will appear in the midst of the seven year tribulation. The way these two witnesses become the source of Israel's salvation is that at the tribulation they will be killed by the Antichrist and their bodies will lie unburied in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days. Then in the sight of all, their bodies will ascend into heaven according to Revelation eleven thirteen. The resurrection and ascension of these two witnesses, these two olive trees, will lead to four results. I'm going to give them to you. Four things will happen. Number one, a great earthquake will hit the city of Jerusalem. Number two, a tenth of the city will be destroyed. 7,000 people will die, and the rest will be frightened and give glory to the God of heaven, maybe for the first time in their whole life. Number three, the resurrection of these two witnesses will lead to the salvation of many Jews in Jerusalem shortly before they have to flee the city due to an event that has been prophesied even since the time of Daniel the abomination that causes desolation. Number four, that will begin a process of three and one-half years later that will lead to the rest of Israel being saved. Vision number six, the flying scroll. Zechariah chapter five, verse one. 
I looked up again and I saw a scroll flying through the air. What do you see? The angel asked. I see a flying scroll, I replied. It appears to be about 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. Then he said to me, this scroll contains the curse that is going out over the entire land. One side of the scroll says that those who steal will be banished from the land. The other side says that those who swear falsely will be banished from the land. And this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. I am sending this curse into the house of every thief and into the house of everyone who swears falsely using my name. And my curse will remain in that house and completely destroy it. Even its timbers and its stones will be destroyed. That's what the curse will do. Not just to people, but to their property. In this fifth vision, God speaks of a day when he will punish sinners in a divine judgment. The flying scroll represents the Mosaic law and cites violations of the third and the eighth commandments. Did you notice? Stealing and bearing false witness, the third and the eighth commandment, God will come in judgment. The scroll is a curse against the lawbreakers, and in this vision, the curse is being carried out. A major purpose of the future seven-year tribulation is to remove sin and sinners from the earth. Now, I want to make sure everybody gets this. A major purpose, I'm not saying the only purpose, but a major purpose of the future seven-year tribulation that God has prophesied will come. It is unstoppable. It will happen. But a major purpose of that seven years of tribulation, great trial, travail on the earth, is to remove sin and sinners from the earth. It will be a harvest of sinners. You'll be removed. The sin and the sinners will be removed from the earth. The branch is the only hope to escape this curse. Now notice I said the word branch, capital B. The branch is the only hope to escape this curse. Vision number seven, the woman in the basket. Zechariah chapter five, verse five. Then the angel who was talking with me came forward and said, look up and see what's coming. What is that? I asked. What is it, I asked. He replied, it is a basket for measuring grain, and it's filled with the sins of everyone throughout the land. Then the heavy lead, then the heavy lead cover was lifted off the basket, and there was a woman sitting inside it. Crazy visions, right? It's crazy. How do you understand? The seventh vision says that in the tribulation, God will remove national wickedness. In this vision, Zechariah sees a basket, an ephoth, a standard of weight used to measure uh, and weigh dry goods. Wickedness has a way of falsely measuring what should have been a fair and absolute measure. That's what wickedness is. It perverts an absolute standard. The absolute standard uh, illustrates in a basket or a weight or an ephoth. Zechariah also sees a woman who symbolically represents a religious entity. In this case, a false one that is somehow united with an economic symbol that comes, then, then comes the interpretation. Here comes verse 8. The angel said, the woman's name is wickedness. Who's in the basket? wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and closed the heavy lid again. Then I looked up and I saw two women flying toward us, gliding on the wind. They had wings like a stork and they picked up the basket and they flew into the sky. Where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel. He replied, to the land of Babylonia, where they will build a temple for the basket. And when the temple is ready, they will set the basket there on its pedestal. What's the basket represent? Evil. Where's evil going? Babylonia. What's Babylonia a symbol of? The kingdoms of men. Idolatry. All idolatry had its origin in Babylon. 
This woman is a symbol of a religious and economic wickedness. She is forced back into the basket and taken to Babylonia because Babylonian Babylon is the source of all idolatry. Babylon is the source of all false religion. False religion and false economics will always go hand in hand. Where does it all come from? Anybody remember the Tower of Babel? Do you know where Babylon comes from? Babel. Where does it have its origin? Genesis 11. Let me read the first nine verses. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. Notice he says, for ourselves. What was the instruction of God? This is after the flood. What's the instruction of God to the people? Scatter across the earth. Scatter across the earth. Move out. Move out from the central place. They didn't want to move out. They wanted to assemble and build a city for themselves, not rather than obey God. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. What is this? This is an open rebellion after the flood. Open rebellion after the time of Noah, after the judgment of God. Open rebellion against the will of God, the plan of God. Instead of scattering out, this will, keep, this will make us famous and keep us from being scattered over the world. It's not an accident that they're in rebellion. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. Verse 8, in that way the Lord scattered them. See, the will and the plan of God, can you stop it? No, the question is whether or not you'll be involved in it. See, they, they, God said, I'm going to scatter you. I want you to be scattered. And their answer was, no, you won't scatter us. We're going to stay here. Rather than worship you by scattering and filling the earth and, and repopulating the earth with this beautiful breath of life that you've given us and given you glory, we're going to shun you, push you off to the side, create our own worship. The origin of all idolatry is in that place in that scene, Babylon, Babel. But who wins? Verse 8, in that day, in that way, excuse me, the Lord scattered them all over the world. Well, they didn't want to be scattered, but they are scattered. The Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. Why? They couldn't communicate with each other, couldn't talk to each other. All the languages of the world find their origin in that scene. Verse 9, that is why the city was called Babel. Because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. Is God's plan for man unstoppable? Yeah. What if you rebel? You'll miss what he has for your life, but his plan will still be unstoppable. So let's put, apply that to the church age. God's plan was for the church to reveal the glory of God to the world. Yeah. Can you rebel against that? Yeah. But will it stop that? No, it won't stop it. In fact, the Bible specifically says that the gospel will be preached all over the world and then the end will come. Can you stop it? No. Can you rebel against it? Yeah. Can you stop it? No. Can you be a part of it? Yeah. You've been invited to be a part of it, to receive the light of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and then allow that light through the power of the Holy Spirit to reflect through your life. But what if you don't? It'll still go to the ends of the earth scatter what if you don't want to scatter you, you will scatter eventually the end plan of god will be accomplished it's unstoppable what not by might not by power but by my spirit says the lord that's what he reveals to zachariah same thing today will the church be the church because of our might or our strength no by his spirit it's unstoppable the only question is whether or not you're going to be a part of it or you'll become part of babel 
part of Babylon. What is that? It's idolatry. It's substitutes. Who's going to be the substitute? Let's make ourselves famous. Let's make me famous. Let's take my own way, my own path, my own design. Isn't it interesting that the Bible tells us that the rebuilt city of Babylon will eventually become the world capital under the Antichrist? If this is the beginning, if what we're seeing in this is the beginning of idolatry, isn't it interesting that when you go to the book of Revelation, you see Babylon as the world capital of the Antichrist, the final world power. So I believe in the eschatology, the end time events, by the time the tribulation occurs, the church is the vacuum that is replaced by the Antichrist. What is holding the Antichrist back is the Holy Spirit, which is in the church. And when the church is moved out of the way, then there's a vacuum created that the Antichrist will fill. What will be the capital of the Antichrist? Makes sense, Babylon. The origin of idolatry is Babel, is Babylon, in Babylonia. Isn't it interesting that the Bible tells us that the rebuilt city of Babylon will eventually become the world capital under, the world capital under the Antichrist? What was supposed to be the world capital, Jerusalem? Under who? King Jesus. Oh, it will eventually. It will one day. In fact, this whole book of Zechariah talks about the day that one day, Zechariah 14, I'll give you a heads up, that Jesus is going to come to Jerusalem. He's going to sit on the throne of David which really wasn't the throne of David. It was the throne that David only prepared for the coming Messiah. Interesting. This is further elaborated in Revelation 18, which describes Babylon as both a political and an economic capital of the world. So let's hold Zechariah in our thoughts for a moment. And let's fast forward to Revelation. And that's where we'll finish tonight. Let's start in Revelation 16, verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne of the temple, saying, It is finished. Then the thunder crashed and rolled, and lightning flashed, and a great earthquake struck. The worst since people were placed on the earth. Now, I want you to... But why do you think Jesus described that um, the tribulation will be a time so terrible that no one would, except that he shortened the days, no one would remain alive on the earth? Why? Look at verse 18. Then the thunder crashed and rolled and lightning flashed and a great earthquake struck. The worst since people were placed on the earth. There are events that will take place in this tribulation unlike any time man's ever seen. And we've seen some horrible events. Think of the flood. Put it in comparison to the flood. It cannot compare. The flood cannot compare. As bad as the flood was, it cannot compare to the events that are about to take place during the tribulation. And in the midst of that, verse 19, the great city of Babylon. So if you don't understand, so look at Revelation and then hold this thought of Zechariah and then hold this thought of Genesis. Genesis describes Babel, Babylonia, as the source of human idolatry, the source of a rebellion. After the judgment of God, he replants eight people on the earth. Through those eight people, one of those guys, Shem, and his wife, Mrs. Shem, there's going to come Abraham, and from Abraham will come a righteous seed through which the Messiah will come. But in the midst of these eight people, guess what? The seed of Adam still exists. And the seed of Adam goes to a place called Babel, and idolatry sprouts. But fast forward to Zechariah. And Zechariah, he announces a, a preview of a future event that Revelation fulfills. Verse 19 in Revelation again, the great city of Babylon splits into three sections. And the cities of many nations fell into heaps of rubble. So God remembered all of Babylon's sins and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. Can you resist God's final plan? Yes, 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 you can. They did it in Babel. 
They did it in Jerusalem in 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar comes down and crushes them. They did it in the time of the Messiah when Jesus comes. God comes in human flesh. Can you resist? They've been doing it to the church since the church was born in Pentecost. But can you stop him? You can't stop him. So God remembered all of Babylon's sins and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. God remembered their sins. He doesn't forget their sins. Why? Because their sins have never been forgiven. And if God remembers your sins and my sins on the day that we meet him, we will also drink the cup that is filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. But there's an alternative. I will forever see the cross in a different way. When I just realized the prophecy of Isaiah, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. God crushed his son. The punishment that brought me peace was upon him. That day on the cross, the fierce wrath of God. Look at the, He made her, Babylon. In the end, he will make Babylon drink the cup that is filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. But I'm going to tell you, the gospel is this, that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus, the Son of God, the person of God in human flesh, hung on a tree, and Jesus drank the cup of the wrath of God. He drank it. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you and I die in our sins, then that cup is coming and you'll drink it. But if through faith in Jesus Christ we receive the forgiveness of our sins through the sacrificial substitutionary offering of Christ, then Jesus says, I'll drink your cup. All of this can... can can you stop this plan from taking place? No, you can't stop it. But you can stop from drinking the cup of the fierce wrath of God by allowing Jesus to drink your cup. Wow. Revelation 18.1. After this, after all this, I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with the, his splendor, the angel's splendor. And he gave a mighty shout. What's the angel shouting? This is the end. John's seeing the end. God knows the end. He's not making it up as he goes. He already sees the end. And the angel shouts, Babylon has fallen. It's over. Idolatry is finished. The rebellion is crushed. They will drink the wrath of God. That great city has fallen. She has become a home for demons She's a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture and every foul and dreadful animal. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. All the nations. Did, is there anybody that has not been corrupted by the Tower of Babel mentality? Nobody. Everybody's been affected. What happened in Babel became the source of all human idolatry. And what is idolatry? The substitute of God himself. Something in his place. Verse 3 again. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her. Is this a sexual thing? It's not sexual it's adultery is to be unfaithful. And what is idolatry? To be unfaithful. It is a substitute. You could have had, example, you and I could have a relationship with the living God through his son. The whole picture of the church is the bride of Christ. We've been invited to our own wedding. And there's cheaters. There's cheaters in the church. There's cheaters in the world. He says this, the kings of the world have committed adultery with her. Who's her? Babylon. She's fallen. The kings have committed adultery with her. They have fallen in love with a substitute. What the world can be a substitute, but behind Babylon is a person. His name is Satan. He is the substitute. When you bow to idolatry, you don't know it, Maybe, but you're actually bowing to the adversary of God himself. The enemy of God, Satan. The false God. The false Christ. The anti-Christ. A 
3 again. Let me read verse 3 again. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her because of her desires for extravagant luxury. The merchants of the world have grown rich. Wealth. Money. That's why the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. What? This desire for the things of the world in themselves. Is there anything wrong with the things of the world in themselves? No, until they take the place of God and they become your idol. They become the substitute. The pursuit of your life, what you're pursuing, what you're chasing, what you're pursuing after becomes what you worship. One last scripture, Revelation 18, verse 9. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand in a distance terrified by the great torrent, torment and they will cry out, how terrible, how terrible for you, O Babylon, you great city, in a single moment God's judgment has come on you. Can we ever say we didn't know how this thing will end? We do know. We have inside information. I'm going to go back and read something. I want to read, in light of this whole Babylon picture, I want to read the vision number seven, the woman in the basket one more time, and kind of put it all together. Zechariah 5.5. 5. Again, the woman in the basket. Picture the scene. This is as real today as it was in the time of Zechariah, what, 520 B.C., and back in the time of the generation that came off of the boat, eight people, and just a few generations later in the Tower of Babel. Then the angel who was talking with me came forward and said, look up and see what's coming. Look up and see what's coming. What is it? I ask. He replied, it is a basket for measuring grain, and it's filled with the sins of everyone throughout the land. Then the heavy lead cover was lifted off the basket, and there was a woman sitting inside it. Verse 8. The angel said, the woman's name is wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and closed the heavy lid again. Oh, the angel has, of God has the power to suppress the wickedness at a certain day. Why didn't the angel, why didn't the, the woman refuse to be pushed back into the basket? Why didn't she refuse to allow the heavy lid containing her in the basket? Why didn't she refuse it? She can't. The power of God is supreme. Verse 9, Then I looked up and I saw two women flying toward us, gliding on the wind. They had wings like a stork, and they picked up the basket, and they flew into the sky. Where are you taking the basket? Where's wickedness going? Where does wickedness go? Does wickedness find its place in God? Will wickedness find its place near the throne of God? Where's this whole scene in Zechariah? It's taking place around the throne of God. But it's not this wicked basket with the sins of men. It won't find its place in the end around the throne of God, will it? It'll find its place in Babylon. And I can tell you what's going to happen to Babylon. Figurative, spiritually, Babylon is all who have practiced idolatry, all who chose a substitute when they could have chosen God. Verse 11, he replied, To the land of Babylon, where they will build a temple for the basket. They will worship cheaters in Babylon. They will worship liars in Babylon. It'll be called good business techniques or good business practices. Those who can become rich and wealthy. It'll be worshipped in Babylon. To the land of Babylon where they'll build a temple for the basket. And when the temple is ready, they will set the basket there on its pedestal. Idolatry is the worship of a substitute. But eventually, listen... Idolatry will be the very life that you worship. It'll be the pursuit of your own life. Idolatry itself. 
People don't know, that's the deception. They don't know that, in fact, the idolatrous life is actually drinking in advance the cup of the wrath of God. So let me close with this thought tonight. The book of Zechariah outlines the future coming of the Messiah. There's a series of things that will take place beforehand, but it all ends in the same way. There is a king coming to a throne. The king's name is Jesus, the one who offered to drink the cup of the wrath of God for those who are received by faith and trust the Word of God. He's coming and He's going to sit on a throne. A throne announced by the, by the angel Gabriel to Mary even before God placed Himself in human flesh. And He will sit on David's throne and reign over the house of Jacob and His kingdom will never end. You and I have been offered to allow Him to drink the cup of wrath which means idolatry cannot be in our life. Idolatry, who would we to live an idolatrous life? We, we are not, we're not those who choose a substitute. We're those who what? We've chosen Christ, and, and we remain in Christ, and Christ in us. We're, we're engaged. And let me paint this last scene. In fact, the church is described over and over and over as the bride of Christ. We, we cannot be unfaithful to our bridegroom. How can... How can we be unfaithful to our bridegroom? And our entire life is in final preparation for the wedding. The wedding supper of the Lamb. In which we will experience His presence. And once we come into His presence, we will never know anything except His presence. Can you imagine right now? Let's close tonight with this, this beautiful picture of a wedding. And the wedding can never end in unfaithfulness. It can never experience because all unfaithfulness is a picture of Babylon and Babylon will be the one that drinks the wrath of God, the separation of God. Their unfaithfulness has brought the wrath of God upon them and they will be separated. But those who drink from a different cup, from the cup of Christ. Think of communion when, we, when the new covenant, this is a cup, the new covenant in my blood. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I will raise them up at the last day for, for the wedding. <laughs> Father, tonight in Jesus' name, we honor you. We thank you that on the cross, Jesus drank, drank the cup of the wrath of God. Willingly, he drank the cup in my place so that I wouldn't have to. What was destined for those who lived in idolatry. And Lord, before Christ, I lived in idolatry. We lived in idolatry. We had substitutes. We were heading for the wrath of Babylon. And Lord, you came and Jesus drank the cup for us. And tonight we celebrate Christ and the wedding. And we prepare for the wedding as we wait for our King in Jesus' name.